All right, so this is Intro to Python for Security Professionals with Ravin Kumar. Ravin is a data security or is a data scientist by day and a hacker enthusiast at night. He's been involved in security circles for over a decade now and is a key holder at 23B Hackerspace where he and other key holders maintain an open space for the community to come learn anything from fabrication to lockpicking to cybersecurity. Please welcome Ravin to Shellcon 2018. Yay. All right. Well, thank you for coming. I assume a lot of you uh, want to learn Python, so I'll go through uh, the same basics the, uh, about me with that one. So, yeah, um, Ravine or Canyon is fine. I'll use the full view. Relevant things, killed at 23B. Uh, there's a lot of hacker spaces in Orange County, so there's Null Space Labs, there's Mag Labs, um, DC562 hold to meet up. So, if you enjoy this sort of thing, you should show up to any one of those four. They're all over the place. Um, I write a lot of Python for work. I'm not a security person professionally, but I do uh, Python for data science, data analysis, which you probably read about in the news and whatnot, and machine learning, all that crap. Um, so I write a ton of Python for that, but I certainly enjoy the security community, which is why I come out to these things and DEF CON and all that. So why this talk? Um, a lot of the security professionals I know uh, use Python lightly, or they want to learn Python, um, but they have to learn a lot of things, so I figured this would be a good one. Uh, if you want a great introduction why Python is useful, you can, uh, Emily's talk, if you were in that, she uh, had a great talk about how she uses Python in her day-to-day -day work, and it was a fantastic, fantastic um, explanation of how um, it helps her with sentiment analysis and figuring out whether people are, um, what people are saying about her clients and all that. Um, also, Kali Linux has a lot of Python tools in it. There was one in particular I'm that I'm going to go through. It's called Brutespray. We'll speak about that in a second. So Python is super useful um, in data science, financial analysis, and cybersecurity. So I figured we're good here. Um, you're going to notice I have no slides for this presentation. I'm going to do the whole thing live. So we're going to see how that goes. It's be a whole experiment. Um, so you can grab everything off of the GitHub repo if you want. So there is a GitHub repo. It's got literally everything I'm going to cover in this um, step by step. So if you're trying to learn Python, I, hopefully it's a good resource. We're going to be going through all the code that's in this repo in the next 50 minutes. So. And then legal stuff. Uh, everything I say is my own opinion, so I'm not representing anyone. I work for a company. I'm not representing that company or anything else. So uh, with that. Let's talk about Brute Spray. Um, so quick thing about this presentation, uh, questions are rewarded. You're welcome to shout them out at any time. You don't have to wait to the end. So does anyone have any questions before we start? No? I'm assuming one. OK. All right, so we're going to be covering the Brute Spray tool. Um, or I'm not going to be, um, let me turn the volume off. Well, so you're going to hear the audio. but. Um, Rootspray is a tool that's included by Kali by default. It's a, it's a great example of Python and Python's use in uh, the security industry, which is why I'm, I want to go through how it's built. Essentially, what Rootspray does is it takes an Nmap scan, and it finds all the targets that Nmap found. And then it will then try and brute force um, all of the sort of endpoints and stuff it found. So it's a little hard to see in this, um, in this video. But essentially, it's going through everything found in Nmap, and uh, it's, it's hitting it with like default credentials, so like password, password, Postgres, Postgres, sudo root, all those sorts of things. Um, Brutespay is an open source tool as well. It's online, so if you use Kali, it's there. Again, it's a great example of Python. So let me go through. I'll just show you the source code. This is the source code for Brutespray. It's, it's long, and if you're not used to Python, it looks scary. But really, it's just composed of a few basic pieces that are used over and over and over again. So once you learn the few ingredients, you'll be able to go through it. And I guess for street cred, I wasn't planning on doing this, but as I was uh, learning Brutespray for this talk, or going through Brutespray this talk, I ended up contributing it to a bunch. So there you go. Now my cousin Kali. So now you can believe I actually know how to do this stuff. So let's talk about how this talk is going to work. Let me show you how this talk is going to work. Um, I have a bunch of directories, and maybe it's a little easier in a GUI. So let me go through a GUI first so I don't scare you guys with a uh, terminal if you're not used to it. Um, there's every single one of these folders or directories contains a, a, a file called hack.py. We're going to be talking about Python and scripting. So what we're going to do is we're going to slowly build up the basic functionality of Brutespray in 11 steps. And my hope with doing this is that uh, when you see 
like Brute Spray, it's a whole bunch of scary code and you can't really figure out which piece is which and where, what fits where. By building it piece by piece, I hope you're, you'll be able to find the points that maybe you're confused on and you can focus on those or you can see how the whole thing is just stacked together. All right. Seriously, no questions? None? Someone should. Could you put your GitHub back? Yeah. And because you asked a question, you get your choice of candy. You want Hershey's Reese's Kit Kat or Hershey's Almond? <laughs> yeah. Hershey's? Good. Sure. All right. Cool. That's what you get for questions. Yeah, now people are asking questions, huh? What was that? Uh, yeah, you're going to have to ask a question. There's going to have to be a good one. Everyone will learn. What was that? What's your favorite color? Green. That's the only easy one you're going to get. After that, they're going to have to be legitimate questions. <laughs> also, you're going to figure out that, uh, that I'm not. Uh, yes, my GitHub link is right here. Candy29, uh, Python for Hackers. So if you Google Candy29, Python, uh, Python for Hackers, and GitHub, you'll get to, uh, get to this repo. Yeah, you guys are going to find out I'm not great at sports, so I'm sorry if I hit somebody in the face. So if we talk, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll talk about Brutespray only for a minute because I'm going to run out of time. Uh, Brutespray supports a whole bunch of protocols. It's a really well-developed tool, and I think it's a fantastic. It, I'm using Brutespray as an example for pen testing tools. If you want more examples, watch Emily's talk or, or go talk to her. She, she's developed an entire tool chain that supports uh, what she does. It's a great example of how Python is useful in InfoSec. So it's, Python's a fantastic tool to automate and do a lot of things that are common in, in InfoSec. Frankly, data science, because I'm in the data science community and a bunch of other fields, which is why I'm doing a talk specifically on Python. All right, so let's talk about Python real quick and how it works. So Python is installed by default on every Linux distribution and, and all Macs. It's just, it just happens to be there. Um, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fire it up a weird way to, as an explanation, but I'll show you why I'm doing it this way. Um, if you have a Mac or, or Linux computer, you're going to get Python 2.7 usually by default. It'll just be there. On my Mac, it's on the user bin directory, as you might expect. Uh, the one nuance I'll have in my talk is, since I use Python a lot, I've installed the custom versions for myself. When I type in Python, I get um, 3.6 by default, or sorry, 3.5 by default. Um, if you run a, again, if you go on a Mac or Linux, you'll have 2.7 by default. Why is this important? Um, Python 2, or Python 3 was released in 2010. And actually, I'll just pull up the, uh, let's make it easy. Vim, cd01, that's vim, hack.py. Python 2 or 3, there's actually no question about it now. Use Python 3. Python 2 is end of life basically in a year. Um, there's not a point to learn it anymore. It's been deprecated or it's going to be deprecated really soon. You're still going to see a lot of Python 2 because there's a ton of legacy code built in, but if you're brand new, I would suggest, strongly suggest starting with Python 3 because pretty much everyone's going to switch over in, in a matter of months at this point. So no question, Python 3. Everything I run will be Python 3. Um, so Python 3 is not a distribution. Python 3 is a, is a standard. Uh, so Python is an interpreted language, and this is actually a good segue. Py all Python is, uh, um, is, is a, it's a set of files. So this file, this text file, is Python. It's written in, in, in the Python standard syntax. Now, there are, there are numerous interpreters for Python. There's, there's the standard Python. It's called C Python or Cython. It's usually what 99% of people are talking about. But there's, uh, there's things it's called PyPy, which is a Python interpreter for Python. There's Iron Python, which is a C Sharp interpreter for Python. So keynote, Python is an interpreted language. And a lot of people make interpreters. C Cython is the, uh, or C Python is the most common. It's what most people talk about when they say Python. So when you write Python, you're basically writing a text file, and then you're asking an interpreter to interpret it. I am not using the default Mac interpreter. I'm using an interpreter that I installed, because that's the one I like. Uh, that doesn't matter if you're using, what's that? Oh, sorry. Um, I use the Anacotta distribution, because it really, it works really well for data science. Yeah. It, it just dump it on in a directory and stuff. I, I just install it. It's a .sh file. And it just all, it does all its magic to take over my computer. So we'll go with it. Um, for other terminal magic, and this is how I'm going to run the talk, the bottom one is going to be me in a Vim. So Vim is just a text editor. It's just like Notepad++ or Notepad or Atom or whatever you want to use. The top one is going to be the bash shell where I'm actually going to run this stuff. So Python runs in one, uh, one in numerous ways. The one that's that um, in the InfoSec community that's probably the most useful is um, you just type in Python 01, and then you type in your file, and you hit enter. 
and it'll actually run that file. So if I pull up the file below, all I'm doing here is I'm hacking Canyon on my on MySQL, and that's what happens. What's happening? Python runs this one command. So that's your first Python program. All right. So what we're going to start doing now is we're going to start building it up. The print command, you know, cool. You can print stuff to a terminal. Uh, but pretty boring. So we're going to be sticking with the print command for a while. And then I'll sub it out later to show you um, how Brutory works. So we're going to talk about data types next. So vim02. Oh, my autocomplete doesn't work. No. See you got that. All right, live coding, off to a great start. All right, Python has a lot of data types. The first thing you should learn about Python, if you're going to go do it, is learn about all the ways you can store data in Python. In this talk, we're going to be covering strings, in, uh, dictionaries, and integers. But Python literally has thousands of things. Um, if, you're, if you're a computer nerd, I'm going to say the thing that Py everything in Python is an object. So if that means something to you, then cool, you understand? If, you, if it doesn't, then don't worry about it. That's a far out thing. It essentially means that um, things in Python act certain ways. So we have two things here. We have uh, a list. Oops, probably won't, don't want to do that. We have a list, and then we also have um, a dictionary. A list is just like a shelf. You go in, you've got the first shelf, you've got the or second shelf. Dictionaries are like lookup values. And to demonstrate that to you guys real quick, uh, I'm going to fire up a Python interpreter, and I'm just going to do it live. So uh, let's say a equals, and then I'll use Sean as an example. I'll probably use Sean as an example a lot. I'll use Muriel as an example, too. Oops. All right. Well, I messed that one up. With a list, you, you index it by, um, you grab things out by index. So Python is zero indexed. When I type in a, or a zero, I get the first thing out of the list. When I type in a one, I get the second thing out of the list. The other thing Python supports, and is frequently used in Bootsbury, is the thing called dictionary. So we'll make b, and we'll assign it to a dictionary, and we'll say, uh, we'll map 1 to 5, and we'll map um, 4 to, I don't know, 20. I'll just type in 20. And now, with a dictionary, I grab things out. When I type in a 1, I get the 5, but not because it's the first thing. It's because it's the thing that's mapped to it. And if I type in 4, I end up getting 20. And I can actually create new keys. So if I want to say um, shellcon, for instance, and I want to assign that to conference, now I can grab out conference by typing in shellcon, and my dictionary is updated with shellcon. So list and dictionaries, super, super handy, used all over the place. Um, another point I want to make is I put, I put like links to examples in Brute Spray for everything I'm going for. So if you, you can see where it's being used in a full-blown tool. You can see the basics. You can see where, it's, where it is. So what we're going to do here. Oops. So what's happening here is we want to hack a couple people. We're going to hack Canyon, because this is a jerk. We're going to also going to hack RTZQ0, who's also a huge jerk. So we don't like either of these people. We want to get in and wreck their SQL databases and emails or whatever we end up finding on their NMAP scan. So we have, we have two people on a list, because we're going to, we want to hack two people. And then we have two protocols. We have Postgres, and we have, we have POP3. Now, it gets in, um, Postgres is basically a version of SQL. So when I type in Postgres, I want Brute Spray to just hit it with a bunch of uh, SQL commands. And if I, if, it, if I type in POP3, that basically is just an email address. So I want it to um, hack somebody's email. So when I run the script, so uh, less, where am I? Python 02 hack. There you go. You get the output. The first one, printing, hacking, uh, Canyon, and then hacking RTZQ0. That's from the list right here. So um, Python has strings, and you can mash strings together by saying hacking plus, and you've got me, and then hacking plus the first person, RTZQ0, and then you got protocols, hacking um, on POP3. So here we say hacking person at the index 0, protocol POP3. That's basic data types in Python. All right, let's go to loops. All right, so it's annoying to type in all that stuff over and over again. So Python supports loops, um, while loops, but we're just going to cover for loops. So we want to say for person and people 
just hack them. So you can imagine if you had a list of 100 targets, you literally don't want to type in the same thing 100 times. Hack their email, hack their email, hack this person's email, hack that person's email. It's way easier to get a list of people and then just say for every person in my list, just hack each one. Python is a really, um, it's got a lot of what's called syntactic sugar. You don't have to do all the, if you guys have written C or any of these lower level languages, you have to do like index pointers and it's a whole ordeal. With Python, you just say for person and people, which is my list right here. Let's hack them all. Python also supports a fancier syntax. And what it does is it's called, uh, it's called unpacking over iteration. If I pass it a list of lists, because you can do that in programming, you can have shells and then you can have more shells and more shells like a Russian nesting doll. You say for person and protocol and people protocol, hack that person with protocol. So what Python does is it sees that it's got this thing and then this thing it says, oh, this is the person and this thing is the protocol because I've assigned those two here. And then it, over here, you've got a person and a protocol. Print hacking that person and hacking with that protocol. And then this is a very advanced one. If this one is confusing, don't worry about it. But this is called the list comprehension. Python then supports another layer where you can do this all in one line. So when I run this, yeah, questions? OK. <laughs> uh, Python 02. Oh, no, it was 3. All right, so up here, it ran it three times. Or, uh, yeah, so you got one, all right, I got, yeah, one, two, three. And then here it is just doing the list and packing, the list, um, the list comprehension. So you, you can see with one line, it printed this out twice. So here's one line, or two lines, but it's, it's iterating over this array. And then over here, it's also iterating over this array. So those are four loops in Python. It lets us just do a thing over and over and over again, very, very handily. All right, so we're going to build on for loops. All right. And, yep, I'm already there. All right, another basic programming construct. You don't always want to do the same thing for every uh, line of code. You want to do what's called conditional flow. So if, some, if something is happening, or if a condition, then do another thing. So we have our two uh, data structures. What's this one? Anyone want to take a guess? No one? All right, one person is paying attention to the talk. Anyone want to grab the second one? No? All right. Yes. All right. Two people answered. Who do we put with that? Anyone's paying attention? No? List of lists. So we have both our data structures to store everything we want to do. So we have, we have two protocols that we want to use. We have three things we want to hack. We want to hack Canyon on, in SQL. We want to hack uh, RTZQ0 on POP3. And then we want to hack RTZ on his, his SQL database as well. However, we really don't like RTZQ0 because he's really, really a jerk. So when we get to RTZQ0, we want to hack him even harder than the last time we tried. Because, you know, we're gonna, we just... He's a, when you meet him, you'll, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. He's, he's walking around. Go, you can go tell him I said all this. Um, hack .py. So this is, this is all that's happening. When we we're trying to hack Canyon, just normal day-to-day -day stuff. But once we get to RTZQ0, we try to hack him even harder. Because we say if the person is RTZQ0 with the double equal sign, then we're going to run this line of code. Otherwise, we're going to run this line of code. So Python, single equals is called, what's an, is called an assignment operator. You're assigning a thing to a point in memory. And double equals is the uh, equality check. Does Python have a triple equals? Uh, Python doesn't have a triple equals because Python was designed and I don't want to say by someone smart. The other guy is smart too. But the other guy made a mistake, and then you can't break the internet. So then you have to just hack on layers of crap on layers of crap, which is why JavaScript is triple equals. JavaScript is double equals, but try it and watch all your code fail because it doesn't work the way you want it to work. It has triple equals because they realized they messed up, but they couldn't deprecate the entire internet. Python decided to deprecate version 2 and sort of wash away its mistakes, which is why there's Python 3. So, yeah. That is, that is an excellent question. You want a Reese's? That was a really good one, actually. You get two. <laughs> All yeah, love it. So, yeah, equality checks are a thing in, in programming languages. All right, and I know these ones are pretty boring, but we're just going through very basic language constructs, and then uh, it's going to ramp up pretty quick once we get to the fun stuff. Oh, wrong one. Okay, so 
uh, we've been we've been uh, putting strings together by by doing pluses. Oops, I don't want to break my code in the middle of a talk. All right, so um, you can put strings together by saying hello, and then plus um, something. Uh, but this makes you look like a noob in Python. I don't want any of you guys to write code and people judge you. So the actually the better way to do it in Python for numerous reasons is do what's called the string interpolation. So you do hello. You put in uh, two braces like this, and then you put uh, dot format, and then you say, I don't know, thing. And then what Python does is it, um, it takes your argument and it puts it right into the string. Does anyone remember what I said about Python, everything in Python? Yes, it's an object. Somebody who said that? Yes, everything in Python is an object. Oops, sorry. Everything in Python is an object. So the thing is, in other languages, you have what's called primitives, which don't actually do anything. Um, Python, everything has methods, has the ability, everything definitely has methods on it. So we can, we can do another one. I'll just put hello again. And now I've put two things in there. So string interpolation is the way to, way to um, smash strings together in Python. Um, definitely use that. Don't use pluses. Uh, this is actually not in Bootsbury, but it actually should be in Bootsbury. I, didn't, I got lazy after a while and stopped making PRs. Um, so... The, the technical reasons, if you want to be really into it, is it's, uh, it's safer and it's actually faster under the hood to do string interpolation. And as a programmer, it's actually nicer because if you, have, if you want to put numbers into a string, you'd have, to, you'd have to cast them and do all this crap. So just to show you here, to make the point, if I do uh, hello and then I do plus two, Python says, what the hell, can't convert into string implicitly. This is good. And this is actually something to note because we're going to cover it in a second. This is called an exception where your program is telling you that it can't do the thing you're asking it to do because it makes no sense. Python doesn't know how to add literally the number two to a string. But if I converted this to a string, then it makes sense. But the nice thing with dot .format is that Python just does all that stuff for you. So the, there is both technical reasons. Oops, hello. There's technical reasons and niceness reasons to use string interpolation. So that's string interpolation. That's what you're going to see the rest of this, this talk is you're not going to see the pluses anymore. You're going to see uh, the string interpolation. Zero just means first index, and, and one means second index. So that's all the, the zeros and the ones are doing. And so put person. Person's the first argument. Put it at zero place. Protocol's the, the second argument. Put it in the first place. And to, uh, to prove that to you, um, yeah? Can you also a list and use those same indices in format? Yeah, you could. That's actually that's a good point. Yeah, we can do that. And I'll actually, I'll, I'll, I'll um, do a tricky thing, and I'll show you what happens. Um, so Python hack that py. So here we go. Hacking, same deal as before. We didn't really change the protocol. All we did was change our strings. Oops. Um, oops. 20gg. So the question was, can we put a list in? Yeah, you can put a list in if you want. You, uh, if we change this to a list object, um, because this is one object, I'll have to actually take this out. And I'll show you what, what it looks like. So now, because it's, it's one object, Python only has one place to put it. And it'll, it'll put the list right here. So it's just doing. Python is just taking your, your object and it's smashing it into a place. Does that answer the question and help? No, could you use those indices in the curly brackets to index in a list? Oh, with the dot format, no. Um, this is these indices just correspond to. Yeah, in this, uh, in this particular method, it looks at the argument order and that's where it places things. It's just the way this method works. That's all. Excellent question. Did I give you something? What do you Reese's? Uh, Reese's fine. All right. I don't think my mic is going to stay on, so I'm just going to yell. Is that okay? All right. Cool. All right, so let's move on to, um, what do we got now? Exception handling. OK. So going just through basic language constructs, I know, not exciting. Seems to be boring, but we'll, it'll, it'll all tie together in a second, in about 20 minutes, actually. So uh, in Python, if you mess things up, uh, it, it yells at you. It's not, Python is nice. It does a lot of things for you. You don't have to declare variables. It seems like magic. But it's not completely magic, right? It's still programming language. You still have to like obey rules and make sense. So let's 
Let me write an example. Let's say I make a dictionary. I'll make a dictionary called D. I'll say uh, key one, and then I'll say value, just to say key value. Well, if I want to grab key one, uh, it's easy. I get my value back, right? But if I try and grab P2, I get what's called an exception. Python's telling me something. Uh, it's, I'm getting a key error, which is saying it can't find a key. Exceptions halt your program's execution, so once Python hits an exception, it completely stops. This could be annoying, and if you, like with root serving and pack something, if, if uh, Python makes a call, tries to hack the database, and it runs an error, it'd be really annoying if you didn't try and hack the other 99 things as well. You think you're running a script overnight, it stops, and then you have to redo it. This has happened to me. I get lazy times. I don't put an exception handling. I think I'm running a thing overnight, and I'm going to be ready for my boss tomorrow. And then it hits an exception at like 1 a.m. And I come in, it's not done, and then I be crow when I tell my boss my work's not done. So exception handling helps you um, tell Python what to do when it runs into a problem. So in our particular case, we have two protocols that we define support. We define Postgres and we define POP3 for SQL and email. But let's say we also want to hack RTCQ's uh, Cisco phone, which is used Telnet? Well, we don't have Telnet supported, so I run hack.py. Uh, when I run this, my program doesn't finish running. It stops and it hits Telnet and it, it just says I can't do anything, crash Telnet. You can see that it, it printed email, so it printed the key for my POP3, but then it just stops at Telnet. And this is bad. You want to actually hack. RTC Q0, even though we don't have a Telnet uh, implementation yet. So, so what we do, and I'm going to comment this line out just to, uh, just to show you, and we can get past it. Well, we comment this out. Uh, I, didn't, I should have explained this more explicitly. In Python, uh, block comments are triple quotes. And then you block, and then triple quotes end. And single line comments are um, count times. So the program will, or Python will skip these lines for execution. These lines are just meant for humans to read. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a comment in front of the Telnet protocol, so Python doesn't try and run it. Um, now I'm going to run this now. Sorry. Now I'm going to run this, and you'll see that it worked. And here's the trick. What's, what I'm saying is try something. But if it doesn't work, if I get an exception, then print out, print something out. So I'm saying do this. But if you get any sort of problem, then just run this and keep moving on. So I'm going to try printing protocol telnet, but I'll get a key error, as you guys saw before. And so if I get a key error, say, just say telnet is not an option, and then just keep going through, through my, my day. So we're going to try hacking someone on something. We're going to try hacking Canyon on SQL. It works. We're going to try hacking RTCQ on email, and it works. We're going to try hacking RTCQ on Telnet through our for loop, but it's going to say protocol Telnet is not an option, falling back or failed on hack or failed hack on RTCQ zero. That's what's called exception control. It's very handy for dealing with problems in your in your uh, program. You say do this. If you run an error, don't worry about it. Keep moving on with all the other things. Exception handling is a little more of an advanced topic, so if there's, any, if there's any confusion, please feel free to ask. I'll pause for a second. Do you create multiple like, attempts? Like, if this is working, you can create like, a series of tries? Yes, you can do that. You can, you can have a series of tries. You can say try, except uh, value error. So if try, and it, if I get this error, then do this. If I get this error, do that. And then if I get this, then keep going on. So Python supports um, nesting try accepts, which is excellent. It also supports um, multiple types of try accepts. So a good example that I have at work, I, uh, when, when trying to talk to a database over, um, over the network, there's two things that are happening, right? I have to go over a network, so I could end up with a network error from my networking library, and I could end up with a, an error from the database itself. So I say, if I have a network error, then just pause for five seconds, and then just try again. Networks are faulty, right? If I end up with a database error, in some cases where it's serious, then I say, stop doing everything and roll back all my database transactions. Because I want to make sure my, for me, data integrity is a huge point as a data scientist. So I capture the error in two ways. I say, network error, just wait, try again. Database error, stop what you're doing, undo everything, and like send me an email and alert, alert me that something went wrong. So, Excellent question. All right, this is going to be tricky. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. 
Yep, uh, Python. It, it's that's another hint. Yeah, it's another nice thing that the uh, that the Python core does built in. So, let's go to functions. How much time do I have? Ooh, we're gonna be a little close. All right, CD functions. We're gonna go through functions pretty quickly then. Fin07. All right, um, in programming, and this is this is one thing um, full-blown programs do. They don't usually write everything out in one long script. Um, which what is nice to do is put things into functions. Functions are just repeatable pieces of code that you can use over and over again. So um, let me actually just print this, modify this a little bit so it's a little more clear. What I'm doing here is I'm saying um, that was a lot. So I'm saying. Uh, to Python, well, there's two things. There's protocols and there's people. You guys have seen this before. But now here's a new syntax. I'm saying define a function called uh, people protocol. And it's going to take one argument. It'll take so, uh, something. And then if, if I'm saying pwn them, then let's actually try and hack them. I have a doc string in there to, to say what this does. Please write doc strings on your functions. I know I say that, and people won't do it. Please do. Um, we have another function down here that's just going to print the target. So I'm doing, I'm doing two things. I'm saying this function is just going to print who we want to hack. I'm saying the other function is going to actually hack the people. So I've sort of created my routines in these blocks of code. An important point about Python, and I should have mentioned this earlier as well, Python is white space indented, so there's no curly braces, the things you see in Java or C Sharp or, or uh, even JavaScript. Uh, when you want to make a code block, you put an indentation in. So what I'm saying is to Python is this is a function. Here's all the code that's in the function by a single indentation. The, the for loop indentation is saying uh, what, it should, what it should try to do in the for loop. And the try indentation is saying what it should do if this try fails. So in Python, that's how you control um, the flow of the program or indicate to it what um, code is part of what block. In this particular case, what we're going to do is we're going um, we're to just run these functions. So when I run this, I just print out the names of the people that are being hacked. My next thing I say is actually just try and hack these people. So now we're getting back to our hacking, where we're getting a Canyon and RTZQ0, and we're running the old hacking code. And then I'm telling it to redo the print code. And you see that I don't have to rewrite it again. I just call print again, and it'll just run the print. So Python syntax, def, um, method name, method or function name, and then the arguments you want to have to the function. Uh, Python supports keyword arguments and, and positional arguments, if that means something to people. If it doesn't, don't worry about it. You don't really need it for, um, for brute spray, actually. I don't even think they use keyword arguments. All right. All right. So we're going to make it a little more interesting now, and this is where we, we're sort of we're sort of moving past the Python basics and moving into some of the more um, I don't know specialized code that that's good for this application. So as of now, we've just been um, all we've been doing is telling Python to print things. That's not really that exciting. It, we've just been working within the bounds of Python. A really, really handy um, use of Python is to tell the OS or other things to do things. So in Python, um, you can actually tell the, the operating system or the bash shell to do something. In this case, we're telling subprocess, which is the, the bash shell, to echo um, the hacking command. So from now on out, when you see me run the hacking command, it's not Python that's printing it, it's the OS. So the real world example of this is Brute Spray doesn't actually run the hacks itself. It calls a C tool called Medusa, which parallelizes the hacks on a bunch of uh, the, um, the brute force attempts on a bunch of other computers. So Brute Spray itself is just calling another Kali tool and automating the use of that Kali tool. I guess this guy got tired of typing in the Medusa for each one of his, his targets. He just wrote up a, a Python layer to call a C program to do that same thing 100 times. You can, with Python, you can, uh, it's a really good what's called glue language. You can use it to automate stuff in pretty much every other language. You can use Python to call JavaScript commands. I use it to call APIs all the time. I run SQL commands from Python. Like, um, Python just does things for me in other, uh, other languages and other protocols, and I just like it a lot because it's easier to write, um, so I don't have to mess around with low-level C code, or, or I don't have to write database commands by hand in my particular field. So the way we do this, and this is an, an important one, we, um, Python doesn't have all, it doesn't import all its code in automatically. It would, I, first off, uh, actually, yeah, there's more Python code than what's on my computer. Like, I don't think anyone in the world could have all the Python code ever on their computer. So what you do is you, you get the libraries and then you import them. So Python's import syntax is fairly simple. You, so you say import and then you just tell it what to import. 
Um, in this case, we're importing something from the standard library. If you're doing um, uh, uh, computer security applications, you'll pretty much be using the standard library. But if you watch Emily's talk, there's a couple libraries that you can install through a thing called pip. Um, so, but basically, we have a bunch of libraries on our computer. And we want to grab a library that, in particular, um, will run OS level commands. And I'm going to do this manually first to make it to show you what's going on. If I want to ls what's in a directory, Python doesn't understand ls. It's a bash command. But what I can do is I can import subprocess. And then I can say subprocess.call ls. And now it'll run the ls command and the bash shell, and they give me the results back. So subprocess isn't Python. Subprocess is Python, but it, subprocess is calling bash. If I want to call c, go for it. If I want to call, I don't know, anything. Fortran. Actually, that is a very important application. A lot of, uh, a lot of scientific applications, Fortran is a super old language. It's a pain to write. People just write Python layers on top of old Fortran libraries. It's really popular. So that's how I mess around with the operating system with Python. Um, the next thing we want to go through is file I.O. So we're going to keep diving into uh, messing around with the files. It's kind of annoying to have to type in the passwords each time, right? Or, or actually, we don't have any passwords. I've just, been, I've just been saying I'm going I'm to hack targets. It'd be nice if we could just download a password list and use that. So in here, I have passwords.txt, and I have two passwords in here. I have password123 and super secure password. So in Python, the way I can, uh, I can grab stuff from the, um, from the file system, I tell it where the file is. So I've imported OS at the top. I tell it I want to join passwords in passwords.txt. Um, the reason being, and I'll use, a, I'll, I'll use, actually I'll use a regular GUI to show this to you. In, my, uh, in here, the passwords are, are one directory up, and the file is right here. So I'm telling Python, go to the passwords directory and grab passwords.txt. And then with opening, opening the file as password file, I want it to grab all the passwords out of here and put it into an array. This is a, a fairly um, substantial chunk of code, and I can't cover it fully in depth at this time. But there are a lot of tutorials online. If you see me at the, around at the conference, just come and talk to me. But otherwise, you can just copy and paste this if you want to read files in. Like if you, you don't have to understand it. This is just the recipe to grab the passwords out. So if I run Python, uh, what do we have? 09. Hack.py. Ooh, no such better. Oh, I know why. Oops. C09. All right. Python. Py. It prints out my passwords, which it grabbed from a file. So file I own Python, it's this pattern. And these sections are going to get a little hand wavy, but we'll go for it. All right. Now 10, Python scripting. There's one. Uh, Programming bit that I have to bring in just, just to uh, sh explain it or show what's going on. You're going to see this, this a lot. You're going to see this if name equals main uh, quite a bit. All this is saying, um, and this has to do with, with the way Python runs, Python can run either what's called a scripted mode where you run the file directly, or it can run as an import of a library. So um, sometimes you're importing other people's code. We just imported subprocess. And sometimes you're running your own scripts directly with the Python program. You might want them to behave slightly differently because the way Python works is it, it actually runs the code it imports when it imports it. So if I had a piece of code in here that said drop database, by just importing that code, I would end up dropping my database. My coworker did this. He was an idiot. So <laughs> don't do this. <laughs> this, is, this is, I know this is programming bit, but it's, an, imp it's an important enough that I want to explain what's going on so you're not confused by it. So I have a simplified example because we have a lot going on. And I'm going to go through the simplified example. Um, although, um, although I also made the larger example so you can see that as well. So CD10, vim, simplified example. So the simplified example just has two pieces of code. It has print and it has running the instructions. So usually up here is where we're defining functions, methods, or globals. Right? Things that were just like, pop3 is email, Postgres is SQL, MySQL is SQL, MariaDB is SQL. We're just bringing up the, the generic stuff. And down here is where we actually want to run things. So um, when, I, when I run Python, so I'm going to run Python, uh, hack dot, so we're going to run the other one. Simplified example, it, it prints both, right? It prints this is a set of instructions, and this is running the instructions. You can see that it doesn't print this first. It prints this is a set of instructions first, because Python 
runs the code top down, hits this block, sees it, runs it, and then it says, and then it, when we have the running portion, it actually runs the portion of code. The difference, and I want to show you right here, when I import hack.py, or sorry, simplified, I got to type it all out, simplified example, I'm not running the code directly. I'm just telling Python to grab the file and bring it into memory. It does not run running the instructions. On the import, it still runs the code definition, but because this isn't the main program that I'm running, it skips everything below. So this is just an if statement saying, if you're importing this file in, don't bother running any of this stuff. Just grab all the code that's up here. Run all the definitions and get everything set up up here. That is, um, I know it's slightly nuanced, but I'll run it one more time. So if I run simplified example, it runs the instructions, and because it's the main target of my Python interpreter, it's also going to run the code down here. If I, inst if I instead run a Python process, so th my main process is actually up here, and I tell it instead to import a piece of code, then it'll just run that. So if you run into bugs or things are confusing later, why certain pieces of code are running or not running, this is usually what I look for first. This, um, as a code style, you usually should uh, put all the code that you want to run stuff or you want to define stuff up here and all the code for running stuff down here. Breed Spray does have this in here. I do, um, you, can, you can see it if you uh, go to the full Breed Spray code. Actually, I'll just, I'll just pull it up. Why not? I have it here. Breed Spray has it at the bottom. This is where Breed Spray is just defining all its methods and how to do things. Let's make a dictionary. Let's have our dictionary for... Um, for our services, where's the service dictionary? Right here. Let's have our service dictionary. So Microsoft DS is just Samba. Um, SMTS secure is just is just your mail protocol. POP3 is also just POP3S is just your POP3 protocol. Um, and it's got another one in here actually, uh, somewhere. Uh, it's got lists, but it's saying that this is all the stuff I'm using to define how Brutesbury should work. And this is where we're actually going to run Brutesbury when you run Python Brutesbury.py. Okay. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anything below the, the conditional is going to be called by main. So I pull it into an existing program script, whatever. Is that program then main? The or main is the is the Python is the is the main Python process you're running. So when you a um, little bit into the Python stuff, when you when I run, type in Python, it starts an interpreter. That interpreter it labels as the main. Um, this it labels as the, as the main namespace, the top of the namespace, and that's why it, uh, when I get to this point, the name of, of the namespace that's generated when I'm executing this code okay. is main, so it runs this. When I run it this way, this interpreter is main, right here. But when I import something, it actually goes under the simplified example namespace. So this is uh, Python, you don't, it does a lot of magic for you. If you've worked with other programming languages, you have to explicitly declare namespaces like C Sharp. I know for sure you have to like actually type in every namespace. Python does the namespacing magic for you. Uh, it's just when you, when you, if you don't know how programming works and, and suddenly stuff starts happening, know that Python is implicitly creating namespaces for you. In our particular case, the main namespace is the first entry point and then all the imports are under on, uh, their module level namespaces. Super programmy. If it doesn't make sense, don't worry about it. Just know that this, this is what the line, this one line of code is doing. All right, and then we'll get to our very, very last bit and, and to tie it all together. Hopefully it was all worth it. The last bit is we've hard-coded everything into our program. So when I want to hack somebody, I have to literally type in RTZQ0 or, or Canyon in this. It's not, you have to go in and edit the Python program by hand every time. Not fun, right? It's not scalable. It's not something you're going to do in every pen test, is type in the list of every target you're going to go after. And you would probably not last as a pen tester very long. So there's a lot of what's called interfaces for Python. And the one that is usually the most common that I see in, uh, in uh, security applications is what's called a command line interface. So I'm going to actually just copy and paste um, an example code, because otherwise I'm going to mess it up when I type it. So I'll show you how it works first, and then I will, um, I will go through and explain how I did it, because it'll make more sense. And this is our very last bit. So let's say I want to hack RTZQ0, use the password, my password123 in my pass, and I want to use MySQL and POP3. I can set up command line flags. Um, for those unfamiliar, command line flags are just a way of telling, a pro uh, giving some inputs to a program on a command line. In this case, I, everything I have up here, it's, it's doing. It's hacking Canyon, it's hacking RTZQ0, it's using uh, MyPass, and uh, 
password123 in my past. Let's say I, don't, I want to make this really simple. I just want to hack uh, someone on pop3. I just want to use password123. And I just want to hack Canyon. Now when I run this, only one line. Up here, six lines, because the combinatorics of this is all those. Let's say uh, Muriel annoyed me for some reason, because she's like that. Now we can try hacking both of us by just putting in a command line flag. So this is, this is usually how, um, if you're in your pen testing, people wrap up their programs. In Python, the way you define um, namespaces, I'm actually just going to go to my, my Gary at this point to show you. Is it? Ah, it's actually worse. OK, we won't do that. All right, it's a little confusing, but um, you have to, actually, let's go with the simplified example first. You have to import an, uh, a thing called arg parse. So you're, t you're bringing in another library, which is for parsing arguments. The way you define arguments is you create a parser object, and you can give it a description if you'd like. And then you tell the parser you want to add arguments. So I'm going to add an argument. I can do short, um, short argument u or long argument username. And I can put help string in. Required is true. And the default is canyon289. I can add another argument here. Um, and then if I want to. If I want to be able to pass in a list of arguments, I give it another, I give, a, I tell add argument that the number of args is plus, which is a list. My advice for this one, it's, you're not going to get it in the next one minute. Um, what I, if you don't see it now, what I would do is just play around with the code. Again, download the code, mess around with some of these, see what the difference is, and what it does to your program through the simplified, um, to the simplified example. So let's, let's go through here real quick. I'll run this last one. And then I think I'm nearly out of time. So I'm going to run my simplified example. I can say u is going to be canyon. Actually, we're going to, we're going to leave that out. We'll leave u out, and we'll just say I want to put in a password of uh, password pw. And then I want to add in uh, protocols. I'll do dash dash pr or dash pr. And I'll do email, and I'll do um, pop through. And, uh, no, I'm in the wrong directory, of course. cd11. So I guess username is required. So that's what it's telling me. Uh, I'll put in a uh, dash u. I'll put in canyon. I'll run this. And now you can see it print out each one of my arguments. It prints out canyon as a string. It prints out um, password and email pop3. And so I know we covered a lot of ground um, oops. in this. But actually, this is actually all you need to recreate a um, bridge spray. Like, Brute spray, all of it is just those pieces used over and over again and in different combinations. So I, um, with this, I mean, this is all you need to know to create a lot of different tools. You probably create tools that can go straight into Kali, like extremely useful tools. Same thing that Emily did. When you look at her talk, you'll see these same elements in there. Um, how much time do I have for questions? Um, four kids left, so. All right, yeah. Questions? We can go through anything. I do live examples. Can you show the GitHub link one more time? Yeah, so GitHub link is... Um, Right up here, uh, github.com slash canyon slash Python for hackers. If it was interesting, I highly advise uh, downloading this code and running it. You'll learn a lot more by running it yourself rather than just watching me sort of blab up here. Um, so just go through the code, get your Python interpreter, run things, change a little bit, see what happens, just play around. Anything else?